So this is our first update on what is Positron actually up to. There's not a lot of graphics in this video, so feel free to move around. So first, two quick updates. The package formerly known as Macro Slides has been renamed to DSlide. That package is getting ready to publish. I've got the PR up for Melpa, and I'm adding some changes that are going to take it from being kind of like a tech demo into something that's mature enough to use every day. I released a short video, I'll call it our vision statement, and in that video I talk about our product design is roughly complete and that our early process is already underway. So that's what I want to update you on in this video. But to frame this conversation, I wanted to bring up an idea of depth versus breadth in open source development, and then talk about some of the bigger opportunities in Emacs, and then how we can have some of these big, nice, shiny things. To frame this conversation around open innovation, I want to bring up a quote from a Ferris Systems blog in 2021 by Alex Kladov. Alex is contrasting this idea of depth and breadth in terms of the value delivered from different kinds of open source contribution. What breadth refers to is that with the diversity of users with their different use cases and their different platforms, all of the little tiny bugs that would get in the way of adoption and would hide in the corners tend to get found and solved pretty rapidly. But Alex also said that the paid work seemed to be going deeper, seemed to be working on harder features that couldn't just be the sum of a bunch of small solutions. And here's the quote that we should pay attention to as open source users. I have a nagging feeling that the imbalance between the community and paid hours can affect the quality of the technical artifact, not just the speed of development. The two styles of work lend themselves to different kinds of work actually getting done. The quote is about Rust Analyzer development. It's a program that was hard to make and it had to be really good. The idea that needs highlighting is that it's not just about how fast do we have nice things, but how nice are they when we get them. When something like TreeSitter or a new LSP comes along, tools where basically most of the hard work should have already been done for us, how fast do we get them and in what condition do they arrive? Are they easy to use? Are they ready to go out of the box? Are they well integrated with packages or are they integrated in a way that's flexible that can really continue to grow? So what are some big things we could fix in Emacs? Three very related issues popular year after year. Replacing the garbage collector, implementing multi-threading, or re-implementing ELISP on top of another LISP. There have been multiple noteworthy efforts on each one of these issues, and just this year I've seen Eric S. Raymond popping up on the mailing list discussing implementing ELISP on top of SBCL. While running concurrent threads in ELISP is a somewhat popular idea, it's probably misconceived. I did some work that ended up provoking the garbage collector, and while it gave me an opportunity to tune my GC parameters, it also showed me that there's almost nothing that's slow that isn't GC pauses. Bad memory locality leads to bandwidth bottlenecks and latency issues. This doesn't just make the garbage collector slow, it also makes execution slow. And there's really no winning with the GC parameters. Because it's non-generational, it always has to mark and sweep the entire region. So even if you set the parameters low, and you only generate a little tiny amount of garbage, you have to mark and sweep the entire region, and you end up with either a bunch of medium pauses, or one big long pause. However, while work on the GC is a little bit more forward-thinking than hoping for concurrent multi-threading, it's probably not as forward-thinking as re-implementing ELISP on top of another LISP to get access to another runtime that doesn't have those garbage collection issues to begin with. In related work, we often see dynamic modules being employed to get around the limitations of ELISP, and that will continue to be the case for polyglot applications where we're bringing in tools that are written in other languages. In terms of integration headaches, improving our dynamic module support definitely offers the most flexibility for package developers and maintainers, but it has the most overhead for users because they have to obtain these binaries, and as we've seen with packages like TreeSitter, it can take some time for the infrastructure to catch up. We could mitigate a lot of this cost of obtaining these binaries by using tools like Nix and Geeks that are very platform and OS agnostic, but then we would have to wrap that tool and make it nice for Emacs. The big thing we need to add to this list is an LLM tuned on Emacs. We need to take the lowest cost LLMs, tune them on things like the mailing list, the manual, the git history, and all of the ELISP and all of the packages, and we need to distribute the weights and make it easy to run these locally and have a manual in every single language that is natural language queryable that can generate examples and can answer deeper questions about code, and especially not just the ELISP code, or even a modified ELISP if we move over to another runtime, but also the C code, and the C interfaces necessary to write dynamic modules. And then the first thing that we do is we reinvest the productivity and make it just like everything else in Emacs, a programmable part of the interface. 
So like I mentioned in the short video, we do have a completed product design. I've got an Emacs client and a backend that's under development. The first feature that I want to ship is actually the funding format. And the reason I want to ship it is because it's actually feature complete in a way. We do know what some of the biggest opportunities in Emacs are and that these opportunities are simply resource limited. So while it doesn't involve rolling out a bunch of administration features that are going to take us a little bit more time to really figure out how to use, it can immediately go to work on really high impact things. So that's one of the reasons why I'm focusing on this funding format first. So while I hope to ship that soon, we can actually already start bootstrapping both the administration and the funding on top of GitHub sponsors. Administration has two key parts. We want to prioritize what are we spending money on, and we want to review what was the value delivered from these outputs. So just like how we would use a GitHub issue to do an RFC and people would indicate their preference for things with emojis, I've decided let's go ahead and just do the prioritization process without any kind of forms or special support just inside of an issue. And that'll also allow us to iterate really quickly so that after I finish up the funding backend, we can dive into the administration aspects with some experience ready to go. And that's on the user side and on our side too, because one of the biggest aspects of any kind of product like this is the communication. So I've got the process set up. There's going to be a weekly issue, and I just want people to emphasize, like, what do you want the work to focus on? What should the sponsor dollars accomplish? For example, focusing on content that increases subscriber numbers. That economizes everything for everybody. Right now, I'm mainly splitting time between the backend features and dslide. But if enough sponsors showed up and the signal was very clear, I would definitely work on the backend full time. So again, while I'm doing this because GitHub sponsors is not ideal, with enough likes and shares and subscribes, we can bootstrap our way out of this.